Hello, my name is Kerry Jensen, and welcome to Code Rage 8. This session is Client Datasets Part 5 Cloning Cursors. You can find the previous four parts associated with my Client Dataset series in past Code Rage and Data Rage presentations. In this, Part 5, I'm going to be focusing on the cloning cursor's capabilities within the Client Dataset component. Before I get started, let me tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Jensen Data Systems, where I am a developer, consultant, and trainer. Over the course of the years, I've published more than 20 books on computer software, as well as hundreds of magazine articles. Jensen Data Systems has been in business for over 25 years, and during that time we've focused on database development and training corporate developers. I've also been involved in numerous training tours, uh, including the Delphi World Tour in 1995 through 1999, which I was the author of and the principal speaker. In 2001, I helped co-found Delphi Developer Days, and this is uh, a, a training tour that tours every spring. I'm currently touring with Bob Swart, uh, who's popularly known as Dr. Bob, and uh, we are currently preparing our 2014 cities. And we also have a special 2013 date in December in London, where we're going to have our traditional two-day uh, uh, lecture seminar followed by a one-day hands-on mobile development uh, workshop. So we're really looking forward to that, and I'll say a little bit more about that at the end of this talk. Here is an overview of the topics I'm going to cover in this session. I'm going to get, begin with a discussion of what is a cloned cursors, and then I'll demonstrate the basic cloning of cursors. Uh, and then I'm just going to spend a lot of time in code. I've got a very basic cloning uh, example that demonstrates the characteristics of clone cursors. Uh, and then I've got a variety of different clone cursor examples that I hope inspire you to think about clone cursors quite a bit differently. Um, some people just think of it as a way to have two different or three different current records in a data set simultaneously, but there's some very powerful powerful things you can do with clone cursors and I really more than anything one reason why I wanted to give this presentation is that I have found that clone cursors uh, can do and, and provide can do very much and can provide me with capabilities that I n would not have considered even possible if I wasn't comfortable with cloned cursors. And so uh, I'm, we're going to look at a master detail clone. We're going to look at uh, uh, deleting in the background clones. I'm going to look at a clone that uh, saves filtered data uh, and actually saves the filtered data, not the data data set but filter data and I'm also going to talk about a technique that I've used extensively in a number of applications which involve cloning and frames so that's the topics I'm going to cover today so let's just get right into the into this here um, a cloned cursor is an additional pointer to a shared memory store you can think of a clone cursor as being a second current record into the memory store of a client data set, uh, or you could think of it as a, another view of the memory store of a client data set. But the important thing is once one client data set is in memory, you can clone the cursor of that client data set to create multiple references or cursors into that one common memory store. Now what's critical about the clone is that the clone and the original client data set share the same delta property and the same data property. The data property represents the current state of the data set and includes all edits to the data set. Edits that have been made since the data was loaded into the client data set or loaded from a stream or loaded from an underlying database. Delta is specifically the change cache. It is the uh, contents that point to the changes that were made to the data, including both for uh, modified records, the original data, as well as the changed data. So clones and the original client data set all share this common set of data in memory. 
This is important because client data sets are the only data set that allows you to point more than one current record at a common memory store. And that's essentially what a data set does in the Delphi T data set interface. It references data with a pointer to a current record. Now what's really, really important to understand about cloning in client data set world is that the original client data set that gets cloned and its clones are all precisely equal in terms of their capabilities. For example, I could take a client data set, let's say client data set 1, and I create a second client data set called client data set 2, and I clone client data set 1. Client data set 1 and client data set 2 now point to the same data and delta. They are both completely equal members in this relationship. Client data set 1 doesn't have any special capabilities that client data set 2 uh, doesn't have. In fact, I could close client data set 1 and as long as client data set 2 is still open, it is pointing to the say that delta and data that is held in cache. I can now open a client data set 3 and clone client data set, client data set 2 and client data set 2 and client data set 3 again are completely equal in their capabilities. You clone a cursor by calling the clone cursor method. You call this on the cursor that you want to point to the delta and data of an existing client data set and you specify that data set in the first parameter of the clone cursor method. The second parameter, reset, is used to indicate whether or not to Adopt, have the clone cursor adopt the properties that are otherwise independent between the clone and the original client data set. These properties include index name, index field names, filter, filtered, master source, master fields, on filter record, remote server, and provider name. If you set reset to true, those values are not adopted from the cursor that's being cloned. If you set it to false, the client data set that you're calling clone cursor on will adopt things like the filter of the cursor you're cloning uh, and these other independent properties. Keep settings is a, is a parameter that you use to indicate whether the clone cursor should keep its settings or not. You need to be careful to, if you ever call a clone cursor with a reset of true, which means it's not going to adopt the properties, and keep settings equals false, which means the, uh, the cloning cursor is not going to keep its own settings, because you could end up with a situation where the, the clone has property settings and values that are inconsistent with the state of the cloned cursor. But for the most part, um, most times you call clone cursor, you pass just the first two parameters, the client data set that you want to clone, and the, uh, the reset parameter. And in fact, I'm going to make the argument that reset should always be set to true because of a bug that exists in the client data set. It's not a serious bug, but it's one you need to be aware of. And because of that, I suggest you set reset to true and then reassign the properties for the clone cursor based on the, uh, the properties that you want to adopt from the cursor you're cloning. I just alluded to the bug, and the bug that is if you clone a cursor, if you clone a client data set that is currently filtered, so it has a filter property set to some expression that defines uh, limitations on what that, uh, that client data set should display, and the filtered property is set to true, when you pass a preset parameter of false, the clone itself will adopt the filter, but it cannot be dropped. I had written about this in my blog, and one of uh, a reader, Al Gonzalez, uh, who also blogs on Delphi issues, um, posted uh, a, a possible solution. And I want to acknowledge this because I'm I'm very grateful that he uh, that he went to the trouble of doing this. Uh, this is the blog. It's from um, October 31st, 2011. So if you go down to uh, 2011 in October, you'll find this this description, and uh, what what Al had um, uh, let's see here what Al had had uh, discovered is he looked into the uh, the C code for the client data set, and he found that uh, 
that there's a condition on which the cursor is not being reset correctly. Um, unfortunately, I have tested this, and it, it while it is pretty clear that he's right, um, that he's on the trail, it actually didn't solve the problem uh, because his overridden uh, clone cursor method uh, tests for reset being true. And, and in fact, it's when reset is false when the problem occurs. So um, I'm hoping that uh, someone else or Al will take another look at this and we can solve this problem. But basically, you can get around this problem entirely by uh, passing a reset parameter of faults and then assigning filters if, if, if in fact filters it is, is what you want. And I'm going to show you an example of, of, of uh, using clone cursors and filters to uh, do a rather what I, I think is a, a rather powerful little uh, trick. Okay, that's it for the slides. Let's get to the examples and I've got five of them. So let's just dive right in. The first one is a, a sample project that I originally created to demonstrate filtering and setting ranges and so forth, but I've adapted it to this cloning example. Now the data access performed by this project is very similar to the next three projects, so it's worth uh, taking a moment to take a look at this because it is, um, is a bit odd. Let me go to where I load the data. Data used to always be in the same place for your sample files, so I could create a project in Delphi 6 and you could use it in 7 and 4 and 5, but that's no longer the case. In fact, I should mention that this project probably works in Delphi 3 um, and every version after that. However, I've had to adapt to uh, locate the the file it's where the data file is. Now I want to point to the items XML. So 32-bit Delphi and Delphi 7 and earlier it'd be common files, Borland shared data. Uh, once Code Gear came into the scene then we were in common files, Code Gear shared data as of um, version 2007 or so uh, we're finding it over in users public documents rad studio and then compiler version this is actually a constant which is 26 for xe5 and I'm subtracting 14 and adding the point zero and every version of Delphi uh, that started adopting this seems to work so hopefully I won't have to change this kind of data in the future so um, now let me go ahead and run this project. Now by default, this is the main form and the first thing it did was open an instance of this form. Uh, one important point to note is with both of these clone cursors example, one with reset and one without, is that the way that this is working is it's creating a new instance of this one form and then pointing to the client data set on that instance and cloning the cursor to the client data set on the source form. This form here that is uh, opening that other form. And it either does it with a reset of true or a reset of false depending on which of those buttons you click. So here's reset with true and notice it says, says client data set with reset. Uh, let's move this so we can see some data here and here's a client data set uh, clone without reset. Now what I want to demonstrate here is I can come down, let's, well actually let's even set an index so that we can see that uh, item number, I know there's an item number index. I'm going to say use the item number index. Um, no, we're 1003, 1003, 1003. Let me come down here and type in uh, a new item number and you'll immediately see these change because that's the nature of, of these beasts. Uh, okay, let's, let's come to this one now and change it back and we click and they've all changed. So you can see there is a memory store. If we were to look at Delta, we'd see that they both show the change that was made in there, at least when there were changes. If we delete records, it would have the deleted records in the change cache. Uh, we could, uh, any one of these data sets can be, uh, uh, can be, uh, cloned and over and over again and the client data set in each of these forms has the same level of uh, capabilities and responsibilities as the original client data set which was here's the original form let me close it now notice here I can come in and uh, we'll change this value back again notice it changed and come over here 1313 it's just it's these are equal clones they're just they're just the same that's in terms of their capabilities and their responsibilities but we'll, um, let's just go ahead and um, 
uh, that's that's fun to play around with, but that's just the, the start. That's the first example of cloning. Let's get to something a little more a little more meaty. Um, this is one that that I really love because it's it's so unusual. Again, it's getting its data from the data sources that I was talking about, and there is. Um, a, a client data set here, but I'm only going to load uh, the data once, but I'm going to show a master detail relationship with it. So you might think, well, how? why would you ever want to do that? Well, there are some uh, examples. Let me actually run this project and you'll get a sense of what's going on here. So this is, again, the items table, and what I'm doing is when I select a, a record in the uh, in the top part, what's happening is I'm getting a filtering of the records in the bottom part and basically what it's doing is when I select a record at the top it shows all the other records that has that same part number ordered so suddenly this doesn't seem like such an odd odd thing does it I'm able to look and see other orders that have that same part number. Now one really interesting uh, additional option that I've placed in here is that I can either include or not include the order that's here. So this is 1004. Notice that it also appears here. If I uncheck this then it shows just the other orders, not all orders that have that part number, but other orders that have that part number. So let's go ahead and take a look at how this was done. Um, it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, a lot of the setup uh, happens on the uh, on create event handler of the form. You'll recognize this this data here. Now, after we open the or you'll recognize my hooking up to the appropriate file here. That is. Now, if you come down here, you'll notice that I'm opening the client data set, and this is rather important. I do have a data source that has an on data change event handler, but I can't have that assigned until after the client data set one opens. And the reason is because of what happens on this on data change. Now you'll see in a moment, um, the next thing I do is I have a second client data set which was the lower client data set and I clone the cursor on the first client data set. I create an index on part, uh, part number called part index and then I select that part number index and then I set the filtered property to true. Actually, just assigning on data change doesn't cause that event handler to trigger, but I do explicitly trigger it here, and that's where a lot of the magic occurs. What I do is on client data set one, the current record, I pick up the part number, and then I set a range on client data set two based on just that part number. If the checkbox the include current order checkbox is checked, then I set the filter to be order number is not equal to that order number. Otherwise, I set the filtered property to an empty uh, an empty string. And you may recall back here, I said filtered was true, and it was filtered on an empty filter. But based on that check mark, I either have that filter um, have a filter expression in there or not, and that produces the effect we noticed. So once this application or once this uh, form is up and this client data set one up here is connected, the on data change event handler is, is assigned, the cursor is cloned, and then the on data change is triggered intentionally or explicitly through code. Now it's happening every time I navigate to a different record. So that's I like that example. It's a pretty cool example of, of using a clone to leverage one copy of the data in memory. Now we could have done this with two copies, but what if what if the data was very, very large? It's only about a thousand records here, but what if it was fifty thousand records? This would allow me to show this master detail view, but only have one copy of the data in memory. So that's that's my second uh, example that I wanted to demonstrate. The third example is another one that I really love because to me it uh, epitomizes the kind of stuff you can do in the background with a clone cursor. And this one is called um, uh, CDS delete range and basically what we're doing is deleting a range of records uh, using a clone. And let's go ahead and look at the effect and then we'll talk about how it's achieved. Uh, you'll notice that I have records here. This is the uh, the company, or I, I guess the customer um, database. 
that is in XML form that ships with the examples. And over here what I can do is I can say, well, let's choose some type of index and then identify a range. And I'm going to say the range is from Hawaii to Hawaii. And you'll notice Hawaii appears one, two, three, four times in this view alone. And what I'm going to do is say delete those records from that range. Now, I want to kind of emphasize that it doesn't matter where my cursor is on this client data set, there is a clone that's going to be created and it's going to delete the records. So I'm still on my same record, but six records were deleted. Now I'm going to cancel those updates and the Hawaii records come back. Let's delete the range again and let's cancel the updates because I really don't want to apply those changes. Let's look at how this was done. I have created a method called CDS delete range and it requires a client data set from whom I'm going to delete and then uh, the index I'm going to use to delete from so that's where I get that and then the values that represent the high and low part of the index so let's go to CDS delete range so there's the client data set the index values and the start from end values. So what we do is we start off, oh and by the way we return an integer which is the number of records that were deleted. We begin by creating a clone and uh, disabling controls on the source which we then enter a try finally so that when we enable the source uh, controls uh, we, we assure that we actually do that. Then we clone the source client data set with a reset of true. With the clone we set its index that's why uh, now we don't want to do that on the with um, we don't want to set the index on the source because it would make the, the the record sort in a way we ne don't necessarily want and then we set a range and what the clone is now doing is it's showing only or it's the clone is only pointing to records within the range so in the case of the way I, I called this uh, for the state name of Hawaii through Hawaii that clone pointed only to those records and while the record count of the clone was greater than zero it deleted an incremented result and that's how that works. So here's a really good example of something in the background going out reaching in and touching this memory and deleting a set of records and in order to do it efficiently you had to use a range and it had to use an index but the primary view that we see here this this principal view of data is unaffected by this operation and we could uh, do you know, we could uh, do this on any number of things. We could choose uh, city and say that we want to re uh, delete from A, um, uh, let's see, from capital A Z to uh, let's say um, uh, G Z and say delete here and it said 14 records were deleted and you'll notice there's no cities that are between A and G in here. Now I'll cancel those updates and now Freeport which is in that range came back. Okay that's the second example or the I should say that's the third example. This next example is one that cannot be run all the way back to uh, Delphi 3 like the first three actually probably could be used in Delphi 3 and later uh, and the reason why is this uses features that were introduced in Delphi 2010 specifically anonymous methods and um, let's see well I know we're using an anonymous uh, method and I believe an anonymous thread so uh, what this, this project does is it allows me to select customer numbers uh, and I do in fact have, let me see, is there, uh, there is a data module here and there's my client data set like in the other examples we've seen we're loading the customer data from one of these sources and um, I have a special routine in here that says return records from client data set. This is really kind of one of the core things it does so what happens here is we pass in a customer number and we create the results set that we're going to return. We create another data set and this is what we're going to use to clone the, uh, the data set that you saw on the form. Now we create a data set provider and point it to the data set that's going to be cloning then we call set provider so that the result set is pointing to the data set provider. So we have this result set points to this data set provider which points to this client data set. Now we cl 
clone a cursor to this client data set, set an index, and set a range so that this client data set now just holds a subset of records, a subset of records from this client data set. And then we call open on the result, which sucks in only the records in the range from the clone. We then free this uh, data set provider, free this client data set. Now the return result client data set has only that subset of records. I've included in this example something that's a little cleaner, which is basically uh, we pass in a data set and a file name and a packet format, and it does essentially the same thing. We clone a client data set, or create a clone, create a client data set that will be used for cloning. We create a data set provider. Now, I don't use this routine in this project. I just included this code for your benefit because I like it's a lot cleaner in terms of how it works. Uh, we set the provider uh, for the clone, and we point the data set provider to the data set that's passed in. We open the clone, and then we save the contents of the clone to the file. So the clone only sucks in those records that are in this data set, whatever, whether it's a filtered data set or whatever the content is. And then we just free the provider and free the clone. Uh, well, I mentioned that this uh, project has a um, has a uh, an anonymous uh, an anonymous method when we call this button this uh, when we when we cr uh, click this button to create my files um, I call the uh, this generate XML file for customer and I that routine right here will um, go and create an anonymous thread the anonymous thread has an anonymous method in it. The anonymous method uh, takes the customer number and it calls that uh, return records from CDS and then it writes this to a file in the same directory as the executable. Uh, what's neat about this is because this is an anonymous method, the customer number that's um, the customer number from here is closed over, so this is a closure, so that this this uh, each individual thread is going to have a different uh, method or a different customer number, and will concurrently write the files to the underlying uh, directory with just the records from the particular customer. So I can come in here and I select a couple of customers and create files for customers, and it's created those uh, three files and written them to the directory where this uh, where this executable is located so there's a lot of cool stuff in there the key though that that I was focusing on in terms of what this project did is embodied in this procedure right here I didn't call this version of it but it essentially takes a data set writes it to a file um, by using a clone to um, pull the data uh, through a, a data set provider Okay, my last example is one that um, I kind of added at the last minute because it's it's something that I find myself doing a lot. And uh, this one, however, is a fire uh, fire DAC example. And um, let me show you what it does, and then we'll talk about how it does it. Okay, what I have here is I have a layout grid, and it has uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different frames, and each frame has data from a different year. Now what's important about this is that the actual query that I execute, we're going to go and take a look at this, this query, the actual query that gets executed um, only pulls back one result set. So let's go down to the SQL and it's, uh, it's joining three tables and pulling in data and um, that's kind of hard to see. Let's bring it up here like this. So we're getting a result set that has years as, as one of its fields. Uh, it's doing an extract a year from the sales date, and it's also displaying company, the sales date, and uh, actually an employee, uh, employee last name. Yeah. And so what I do with that data is when this form is opening, it does the following. This is the, you're seeing the entire code right here. I've got this frame. This is the T grid frame, and let's just take a quick look at it. There's the frame. It has a grid, DB grid. It has a data source on it. And what I do is I first of all um, open this client data set 
that this client data set points to this data set provider, which in turn points to this FireDAC query. And the end result of opening populates the client data set with the single result set that's returned from the server. Then we create a frame, give it a unique name, set its parent to the flow panel. We then create a clone of, um, we create a clone with the grid frame being the parent and then we clone client data set one, which holds the full result set. We then set an index field names, or if we had an index on here, we could set an index. We set the range to the year, and then we assign the data source, uh, the grid's data source, to the clone. So the result is that each of these, each of these frames that we see here have their own client data set, but it's a clone and it's a filtered clone. Now this may not look terribly impressive, uh, but imagine if I had uh, had a frame or I had a, a form that had 30 frames on it and each one had a subset of records from a single result set. Rather than performing 30 independent queries against the database, I'm performing one query and then using clones to display filtered views in their own frame. And I'll just give you an example of where I use this uh, quite a lot. I often display a month calendar and for instance uh, each day in the calendar may have the appointments for that given day. And I only go out and get the entire month's worth of appointments and I use the cloning of client data sets to create the filtered views for each of the days in that uh, in that calendar. And if it's editable so that you could go in and make changes, you're actually making change to one memory store, which means at the end of the day you can use the client data sets change count to determine if there's changes and if so, uh, write that data back down to the underlying database, even though the user may have been uh, making changes to uh, this first day of the month and the fourth day of the month and the tenth day of the month and the, and the 20th of the month and then they hit save we're taking it and all in one batch uh, writing that underlying data back down to the original database. Okay uh, that's it for this presentation I hope I've inspired you to look at cloned cursors in a different way. This is, this is a very powerful capability and uh, I have shown you five different ways in which clone cursors can be used and uh, hopefully you'll think of many more ways that you'll be able to use them in the future. Well thank you for attending my session today. I'd like to point out that the uh, code samples for this presentation are available uh, from jensendatasystems.com slash coderage8. Uh, I had mentioned Delphi Developer Days. If you'd like to learn more about Delphi Developer Days, go to www.delphidevelopertdays.com and there you will find the uh, links to the London 2013 Delphi Developer Days and Mobile Development Workshop. Uh, plus, you'll be able to um, see as we move forward you'll be able to see our future dates for our tours. If you're interested in the client data set book you can find information about that at www.jensendatasystems.com slash cdsbook. I am doing a, uh, a, an extended webinar on FireDAC development including cross-platform development with FireDAC. Uh, you can find out more information about that at www.embarcadero.com slash rad in action slash FireDAC. I also want to mention I'm speaking uh, this October and November um, in October, the third week of October, I'm speaking at the um, DAPUG uh, workshop, which is in Denmark. Early part of November, November 4th through 6th, I'll be speaking at the Entwickler Conference, that's Econ 17, that's in Cologne, Germany this year. Finally, if you'd like to get hold of me, you can um, email me at cjensen at jensendatasystems.com. Um, you can visit my website at jensendatasystems.com and also the last two URLs here are for my blog and, uh, and my Twitter feed. Once again, thank you very much for your for your attendance and I look forward to the upcoming question and answer period. It's really uh, crucial in cloned cursors that the uh, there's only one memory store and all of the client data sets will immediately reflect those changes made to that memory store um, as, as we saw in that very first example that I demonstrated. By the way, I did, I did have one thing in particular that I misspoke about 
significantly, and then I just used, you know, it, it was an obvious, very sil uh, simple mistake. I was making the point that when you clone a cursor, always reset, but when I set it at the last time, I said pass a reset value of, of false, where I really meant to say pass a reset value of true. You don't want to carry over uh, properties of the clone. Uh, because in general, I just don't rely upon that. I've seen some situations where I expected to be on the same record or expected to have the same index, and the clone did not, in fact, do that. I just find it a whole lot easier. Since, since the clone is a separate view and a separate cursor, it really doesn't affect the original. So I always clone and, um, and do a reset, and then if, if I need to, then reapply my indexes. Now, this is, a, this is another cool thing about that, that clone. The memory store itself has the, the index, so if you create persistent indexes using index def, then all the clones have that index available to them. Uh, so you don't need to, a, the, the cloned cursor does not need to build a new index, which, which would be a fairly expensive operation if you had a really large in-memory data set. Uh, so you call uh, set reset to uh, true and then reapply your index names if you're using persistent indexes or if you're just using temporary indexes using index field names then that's fine as well uh, although uh, you will cause a build of an index at that point um, uh, but that's that's a difference another difference is and this is a this is a minor one but the the XML structure of a FD mem table is different so um, FD mem tables as well as other fired T data sets have a save to file and save to stream uh, with an XML format option and if you look at those structures you'll see that there is definitely a difference in the structure of those uh, of those of those of those objects um, and but that's not that's not um, that's not a, 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 a super super big concern. Uh, there there are on the positive side for FD mem table. Uh, it is uh, apparently I have not done the testing myself, but I've certainly read about it over and over again. That FD mem table is very very fast. We also know that there are weaknesses in the client data set. Uh, Specifically, one thing that has come up again and again uh, in questions that I've seen uh, posted to different forums has to do with the number of records. When you get 200 or 300,000 records in a client data set, you start to really see some performance issues. Now, granted, that's a lot of data, and it's... I'm not even sure that it's a smart thing to put that much data into memory, just simply because um, in-memory data sets are usually, we're talking about uh, smaller uh, uh, smaller collections of data. Nonetheless, uh, the FD mem table does not seem to have that particular uh, uh, limitation or weakness or whatever you would call it. Uh, certainly the testing that, that DA Soft did on the FD mem table demonstrates that there are conditions in which it's, it's a highly superior in performance, performance-wise the client data set. Nonetheless, client data set it has a lot of performance associated with it since it is entirely in memory. Yeah, going back to the <clears throat> earlier comment from one of the attendees about he's been using Delphi for years and never once used client data set, and you mentioned about client data set appearing first for client server so that we could locally cached data, metadata, and then changes and so on. And then, of course, multi-tier with DataSnap, uh, it's used. But but in your book, I mean, you have a whole book on client data set and, and using it as, a, as an in-memory store, using it as an XML container. Uh, there's mm -hmm. lots of things, right, that, that all the developers might consider using client data set for besides just multi-tier and, and SQL database backend connection, right? That's that's right, and it's a very good point. Um, its initial design was to uh, hold data in cache, specifically to be able to pass data from a, a Midas, now called DataSnap, server to a client. That was it was basically designed to be the the not only the uh, the data packet format that is transferred from a Midas server to a Midas client, but also the container that would receive the data packet and express it as a T data set. Um, so, you know, but, but the, the point is, and your point is very well taken, which is uh, you don't have to be a database developer to really be able to do some great easy things with the client data set. You could use a client data set in, in, uh, as a replacement for an INI file, and the important thing about that is that data now just, doesn't just have um, 
contextual information or context, uh, context abstracted information, but it actually has typed data with metadata so that you know not only is this field, this one particular value is an integer and this one is a, a floating point value and this one is a string, but you know how, you know what the precision of, of some of the floating point fields are, you know the size of the string and that's, that's a really different that's different than what you have in an INI file where you really have typeless data. Uh, and and it, again, it doesn't have to have anything to do with a database. There are some really cr uh, crazy cool tricks you can do with client data sets in terms of just keeping references in memory and having them searchable, uh, index-based searches, so it's very, very fast, and, and, and other types of things, but not really have a database in the background. Yeah, filtering, aggregations, just creating fields with types on the fly, uh, yep. creating your own metadata, almost your own little NoSQL, uh, you know, key value pair of things. You can do all sorts of stuff. It gives you a new way of thinking about data, sets of data as well. So here's a question. I don't know. Is it asking if uh, T client data set will get JSON load options? I, I know you're not. I don't team, think. But what do you think? <laughs> no, no. I, I now that the. Um, FireDAC mem table is available. I I just don't believe we're going to see any real development effort applied to uh, the client data set anymore. It's um, written in C. Uh, the The source code is available, or at least it was with Delphi 2010. I haven't looked for it in a while, but uh, it's it just uh, it, it, it's not the future technology. The, you know, FireDAC is written in Delphi itself, I mean, which is very very cool. So um, I would say no. You could you could build something yourself. And in fact, I have built um, a routine like I've seen other people build. But I, I do a lot of JSON to client data set and client data set to JSON conversions. My conversions are not perfect. There's some um, there's some certain types of data that I haven't been able to really crack that nut. But I've been I've, I haven't spent you know, whole week trying to do it, but I, I do have a, a routine that takes any data set and converts it to JSON, and then I take that same JSON and I can throw it at a, a function and it returns a full-on client data set with the metadata and populated with the JSON data. Uh, so you, you can build those things yourself, uh, and there's no reason why you couldn't extend the TCI data set class to do that, but I think that if we were going to make a list of wishes and wants, I would I would put that. I would. I, I would ask that of the FireDAC team, because FireDAC is FireDAC rocks. Uh, the more I get into it, the more the more pleased I am of the just the, the, the intelligence of the architecture. So um, what I want to really see is the FireDAC mem table become uh, interface compatible with client data sets, so at some point we can just flip that off and go over to the mem table. Why, why does tclient data set need an index property? Well, it, it, it's not that it n needs it, other than it is a T data set descendant, so T custom client data set is the T client data set uh, ancestor, and then if you go up further, you get to T data set, and T data set supports indexes and index defs, and um, the 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 reason for that is to build in memory indexes so that the searches and filters, or specifically searches and ranges, can use those indexes and, and just apply that much more speed to the in memory nature of the client data set. So all T data set descendants have an index uh, property because it's in, in T data set. Yeah, so it, you know, it has it, it's going to have it, whether it was implemented or not. Of course they want to implement that so that you have high-speed ranges and, and searches in the memory data set. Also for sorting, of course. I mean, one of the, if in my book, one of my cute little uh, client data set uh, examples I have is where you, you uh, click on the, the header of a DB grid and it looks out and it says, well, have we built a permanent index for this uh, this column and uh, if we did, is it ascending or descending and then if it doesn't find the index it was looking for, it creates it on the fly, but it's since it's a permanent index, it's there the next time you click on that column. So I had the, the example I use in the book has got 25,000 records and every time you click on a column, it takes a fraction of a second to build that index, but when you come around to sort, for instance, first name uh, in ascending order, 
a second time, it's instantaneous because it's just simply switching to that index. Yeah, somebody asked, Carrie, are you planning converting over to FD mem tables going forward? Are you entrenched in CDS? I guess there can be room for both, right? Absolutely. Um, I, I need to educate myself more about the FD mem table. Uh, I, it's, I just haven't had enough time to work with it yet. Uh, it is also very interesting to note in uh, FireDAC itself, and this of course my next talk I'll be talking about cached updates, or yes, cached updates. And the implementation of cached updates, it's, it's, uh, it looks nearly identical to the BDE and client data set cached updates, it turns out that there's, there are significant differences here and there, and th those are very nice. So I, I, do, I do want to move to FD mem table when, when it's reasonable, it, but the client data set will still have its place for some time. If FD mem table gets interface uh, compatible, 100% interface compatible with, um, or those two classes get interface compatible, then I FD mem, mem table will probably be the way to go, just simply because um, the architecture overall of FireDAC is is uh, is good, and that's where there's. I mean, it's the it's that's the principal now. FireDAC is the principal data access mechanism in Rad Studio, and consequently, we should. You know, that, that, I mean, that's where the development is going to go into the future. Yeah, I just wanted to rem remind those that hadn't used client data set. There's three. Uh, was it three file types that client data set can load and save? One is XML, two is the second one is XML UTF-8, and the third one is this binary. I guess we call it MyBase still binary format that is internal to client to client data set or the way we implement it. So you have those choices. So if you're doing some XML based maybe B2B applications, you want to have some local storage or a transition point for XML. Um, that's there. I think the other thing is not only filtering, but there also are uh, aggregations and calculated fields with client data. So there's so much. Just go back to Carrie's other previous client data set sessions and previous code ranges. You'll and of course get his book, and you'll learn uh, all sorts of things that are available in client data set. Right. Yes, and what I've really been impressed with is that while uh, before FireDAC, uh, client data set was the only T data set. Descended that supported things like aggregates, group state, filtered navigation, and and uh, several other uh, mechanisms. FireDAC T data sets such as the FD query have aggregates, have group state, have filtered navigation. So the really and of course cast updates. So the really cool stuff that was in client data set, um, Dimitri uh, was uh, clearly. Um, said, look, my data sets need to have these technologies as well. So, uh, Alan asks, are you working on a fire deck book? Well, you're doing the white paper for the webinar, right? I, I haven't made an official announcement, but I have, I, I believe that there is a fire deck book in my future. Uh, once I, once um, uh, Bob Swart and I finish with our material for the mobile development workshop in London on December 6th, um, that's probably my next task is to take my writings and and just blast out and try to get a good solid fire deck put together. I, I'm I'm so I'm in I'm a database guy, so it's a natural, and um, I think I would be able to uh, make a significant contribution to the uh, uh, to the literature and for that particular area. And Jason Wharton reminded us that uh, IB Objects, Interbase Objects, has uh, some of the capabilities you said weren't available elsewhere. So I just put that plug in for, for Jason. He does a great job with IB Objects. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. Um, There's uh, lots of thank yous and uh, yeah. congratulations and much appreciated comments in here. So What we're going to do is uh, is move on because I know Carrie... When when is your hard stop, or is it sometime? Oh no, I, we, we we're fine. I've got once the talk is over, I've got an hour and forty five minutes before my flight, so I'm okay. I just I got here really early. Okay. That's basically. It. I just wanted to make sure I didn't want to have a, all of a sudden hear your voice trailing off as you were running to the gate <laughs> uh, during Q and A time on the next session.